So as I said, today's topic, all about shorebirds. I love shorebirds, as you can probably tell. Uh, Semi-aquatic birds found along shorelines and mudflats that wade in the water to or, in order to forage for food. Uh, my favorites are sandpipers, plovers, curlews, oyster catchers. There's a million types of shorebirds, and they're super fun to photograph. They can be found on any coastline and sometimes even near freshwater. And I have photographed shorebirds uh, near freshwater, specifically solitary sandpipers uh, and American woodcocks as well. Um, so shorebirds can range from six inches long to two feet long. Um, American curlews and, uh, you know, piping plovers, there's a very broad range of shorebirds that you can photograph. And Florida, as I said, is a great place to photograph shorebirds. Some of these images in this presentation were taken in Florida. Um, it's just an awesome place to go, partially because the weather is usually warm. Uh, you don't have to dress for weather in Florida when you go out and photograph birds like we do up here. So that's one thing that I love about it. And now my clicker is not working. We're just we're just dealing with technology issues left and right here. Okay, here we go. So this is a photo of an American oyster catcher that I took uh, in New Jersey in Stone Harbor at sunset. And this is one of my favorite photos uh, and also one of my favorite species. I think these birds are so charismatic. Uh, there are nesting colonies in uh, the South Jersey shore um, that you can visit. And then, you know, the birds kind of work their way down to the water line and they eat sand fleas. And if you go there at the right time of day, you can get the, the last light of the evening, evening sun kind of poking down on them. Um, and I captured this bird with kind of some froth in the waves, uh, you know, showing that, that red eye and that red beak really nicely. So th this is one of my photos that I'd like to start off with here. So why shorebirds? Why, why am I talking about shorebirds specifically? Why do I love photographing them? Well, I think they're really beautiful. They're really diverse and they're, they're quite photogenic. Um, one huge thing about shorebirds that separates them from other types of birds is they sometimes allow you to be extremely close. I don't know if any of you have had this scenario um, where you're just kind of hanging around, you're birding, um, and all of a sudden there's a bunch of shorebirds around you if you're on the beach. If you're kind of still, uh, oftentimes shorebirds will actually come up to you, um, and this can provide really interesting photography experiences that's really unique among types of birds. Uh, so that's another reason why I love to photograph them. It also allows you to be immersed in nature, particularly at the beach, which I love the beach. Who doesn't love the beach? Uh, and then uh, the last thing is that wide open expanses like a beach where there's no, usually hopefully no buildings or no horizon blocking or trees or anything. Um, they allow you to play with low angled light uh, and get creative with your photos, which you really can't do like in the forest or in other settings with other types of birds. So that's the last reason why I love photographing shorebirds. Here's a photo of a snowy egret uh, taken in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Uh, and this is an example of that low angle uh, where I'm right on the water line. And actually the foreground is completely blurred out because my lens was so low to the water. I used a fast shutter speed to freeze the wings and stop the water drops. Uh, and this is an example of a cool bird. This this bird was pissed off at another bird for taking its fishing spot. So it, it did a little uh, angry display here. Uh, and I was you know hanging hanging out near the shoreline with my camera very low to the water and, and capture this image. Were you on your belly? I was on my belly. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that later. <laughs> okay. So this is kind of a broad overview of shorebird photography equipment. This by no means um, should be particular to any one person. Um, obviously, camera equipment is super expensive and a lot of my gear is rented um, to kind of make the cost a little bit more effective. Um, but I would say for shorebird photography in particular, you have to have 300 millimeters equivalent or more. Um, shorebirds, even though they do get close sometimes, oftentimes they don't. That's really a kind of a special situation. Uh, I've found that like the 200 millimeter range just doesn't do it for shorebird photography. Um, and when I say equivalent, I mean with or without a teleconverter. Uh, so like a 200 with a teleconverter would work. Um, but most photographers that I know that photograph shorebirds are using 300, 400, 500 millimeters uh, for their shorebird photography, usually usually prime lenses too. Um, for photography, uh, something that I've always been told is that the camera is less important than the lens. If you're investing in a camera body and a lens, I would spend more money on the lens than the camera body because, first of all, because camera bodies become obsolete really quickly. Um, camera bodies are replaced, the inventory gets replaced like every two to three years. Uh, versus lenses can last 10 years before, you know, Canon or Nikon comes out with a replacement. So I would spend less on the camera body than the lens. 
Uh, but considerations for the camera body are frame rate and low light capability. That's what's really important for shorebird photography because frame rate enables you to capture bursts of action and low light capability enables you to photograph at sunrise and sunset as well. Uh, one, one piece of equipment um, and I don't sponsor, I'm not sponsored by these guys. I have no monetary incentive to plug this at all. But one thing that I love to use is a skimmer ground pod. It's just kind of a small little company that makes just a, like a flat platform that you can skim along the ground and it has a ball head that's attached to it. Um, and you can also put a gimbal as well. Um, and this enables you to get a low angle without having to hold your lens over the water. Uh, so a lot of these low angle water photos, that's what I'm using um, in that scenario. You have the picture of it? Oh, yeah. So here, this, yeah, this is the skimmer. Uh, it's just a little platform, and I just have a really simple uh, tilt swivel head um, from Really Right Stuff on it. Uh, and so my my equipment, I have a Canon 500 millimeter prime uh, version one lens, and I have a Canon 7D Mark II body. Um, so you see it there. I, I have a lens cover on it to break up the shape for birds because the big white Canon lenses are, are pretty distracting um, for, for small shorebirds. Uh, I have a little plastic cover on it. That's one thing that I really recommend if you're at the beach with shorebirds is sometimes salt spray and water spray and sand uh, can kind of nick the lens a little bit. And I like to just keep it nice and nice and secure. I'm actually, I don't know why it's not covering my whole lens there. I must have been really caught up in the moment there, but usually it, it goes down to the lens hood uh, kind of protecting the lens uh, a little bit more than just, you know, without it would. This is actually, so these two photos, my friend took a photo of me here. These are the same moment. So these were taken seconds from each other. This is me photographing a marble godwit uh, with some nice backlight through my curly hair. And then <laughs> here's the marble godwit that was on the other side of my lens. Uh, you can see the light is the same. Um, and that's what happens when you get a low angle like that. If you're really low to the water, um, I know physically it can be challenging to do so, obviously, but if you can at least get a little bit lower than standing, it's really, really helpful uh, because then you get that soft background. People always ask me with my shorebird photos, do you blur your backgrounds in Photoshop? Like why, why are your backgrounds so out of focus? What's the deal there? And I never like uh, artificially blur my backgrounds in Photoshop. It's just from getting a really low angle and also having a 500 millimeter lens. Those, those are the two things that contribute to it because the long barrel, the 500 millimeter, it makes the background blur out and creates more bokeh. Um, and then secondly, the low angle just kind of blurs out everything beyond the subject. Uh, and this marble gawa, this is one of my favorite shorebirds. They're beautiful with that pink bill. This is non-breeding plumage. I actually think they're pretty in non-breeding uh, because they have that pink bill and they don't have the kind of bars on their chest. Uh, but yeah, this, this is an example of that low angle benefiting me for this photo. So the settings I use, this is something that, that people ask as well. Um, and it's something that people are sometimes surprised with, uh, usually for landscape photography or for other types of nature photography, people are like always manual mode. Um, if you're an advanced photographer, uh, I actually prefer aperture priority for most types of bird photography. And there's a professional photographer that I'm good friends with named Ray Hennessy that showed me how to use aperture priority to my advantage for bird photography. So the big the big advantage is that you don't have to fiddle with the settings in the field. So with manual mode, uh, you have to fiddle with aperture, shutter speed, and ISO all at the same time when you're taking photos. With aperture priority, uh, which is also called mode A on Nikon, since I'm a Canon shooter, I use aperture priority. Um, you can you can set the aperture, you can set the ISO, but the camera decides the shutter speed itself. So that takes out a whole variable that you have to think about uh, and just enables you to be a lot quicker and a lot smoother in the field when you're photographing these fast moving birds. Uh, one, th one little tip that I do with aperture priority is I set a minimum shutter speed. Um, it's a little hard to explain because every camera is different um, as far as how to do it. But if you just write down you know, how to set a minimum shutter speed, um, on a Canon or a Nikon, there should be a ton of YouTube videos about it. Uh, but you go into the menu, you put, usually I put one two hundredth of a second or one four hundredth of a second for my minimum shutter speed for shorebird for Darby. And then that prevents the camera from going to a really low shutter speed to compensate. So instead it'll raise the ISO, which I would prefer. If you have a really slow shutter speed, you're, you'll get blurred motion, which you don't want. So I set like that minimum 
stopper at the bottom of the shutter speed range so that I don't get any blurred photos. Otherwise, before I started doing that and using aperture priority, you'd take a bunch of photos and then you'd realize the shutter speed was one twenty second of a second, like, mm -hmm. and all the photos are blurred, right? So you have to set a minimum shutter speed of like one two hundredth or one four hundredth uh, to prevent that from happening. And then it'll just go up from there according to the amount of light that's in the scene. So I use aperture priority, usually a low aperture, like a wide open aperture. I, so I set according to the amount of light coming in the camera, and then I set a minimum shutter speed. That's what I'm usually photographing uh, shorebirds with. There's one exception that I'll talk about later where I use manual, but almost all the time I do this. This is an example of that low light uh, setting paying off here with this aperture priority. I set my minimum shutter speed to one two hundredth of a second, uh, and that prevented anything in this scene from being blurry. Um, the, the black belly plover here is sharp. Um, and then I was able to set a wide open aperture of F4. Uh, and then the ISO was pretty darn high for this, this as well. Uh, but as I'm going to talk about later, you can fix that in post-production with noise reduction. So I'm never too worried about high ISO values. So again, just to reiterate all the stuff that I'm talking about in this presentation, this is my opinion for Shorebird Photography. There's no right or wrong way to do, go about this. Uh, you'll have some people say, always use full manual mode, do, do this differently. But this is just the way I do it um, that I'd like to share with you guys. So some fundamentals that I'd talk about uh, are, this is not going to be a problem for you all, but sometimes I do presentations with camera clubs and they don't know anything about birds. Um, so it's great that I'm talking to an Audubon group that's a bird <laughs> Um, so obviously attaining a foundational knowledge of birds and bird behavior is incredibly important for bird photography, understanding migration. When are the shorebirds going to show up? When do they breed? When do they nest? When do they migrate south in the fall? Where do they go in the winter? That's huge for shorebird photography. Florida is awesome because not only do you have wintering shorebirds and non-breeding plumage, you have summering shorebirds, like you have a great, um, what I think, least turn, snowy plover, Wilson's plover, uh, uh, colonies down there that you can photograph in the summer. Um, and then, you know, you have migrating shorebirds in the spring and breeding plumage, and then they migrate south in the fall and then they winter. So it's all year round is great, but it really helps uh, to attain a foundational knowledge of birds and bird behavior. Uh, proximity to your subject is really crucial. That's why anything under a 300 millimeter is not really long enough for this kind of photography. Um, it helps to try to anticipate the shorebirds movement, which again, for you all is not going to be a huge problem since you're birders um, and waiting the birds, waiting for the birds to come to you is super important. What I used to do when I photographed shorebirds a long time ago was I would chase them, not Ooh. literally, but I would, I would walk along the beach and try to follow them and they would kind of slowly creep away. They, would, they wouldn't fly, but they'd kind of walk away and they just kind of keep edging farther and farther from me until they were just out of range. So what I do now is I wait for them to come to me. If I go to a beach, say I go to Fort DeSoto and I'm doing some shorebird photography, I will scan the beach with my binoculars. I'll find a group of shorebirds and I'll watch them for 15 minutes and see what they're doing. I'll look, you know, are they are they moving north or south along the coastline? What are they doing? What, what's their kind of how spooky are they? What's what's their kind of movement? Um, and then what I'll do is I'll plan myself ahead of them. If they're moving in a certain direction, because if there's a shoreline, they're either going to moving one way or the other way. There's not there's not four ways they can go. They move up the coastline or down the coastline. So you kind of watch them and see which general direction the flock is moving. You plant yourself ahead of them and just wait for them to come to you. So that's how I get close to all these shorebirds. Instead of just walking right at them and having them creep away from you, it's really important to watch them for a little while, take the time. Um, and then when you invest that time in to see what they're doing, then all of a sudden you can plant yourself in front of them and then have them walk right up to you and not even know you're there. So that, that's how I get close to these shorebirds in all these photos. Second to last here, uh, I like to get as low as possible, as I've said. If you're unable to lie prone, that's fine. Uh, try maybe sitting down or kneeling. Um, just getting lower than standing height is going to provide 10 times better of a photo uh, than if you are on a tripod standing at, at, at full height. Secondly, it's way easier to scare a shorebird if you're standing up. If you're a, you know, between five and six foot human looking down at a shorebird, it's going to be freaked out. But if you're lying prone or you're sitting down, it's going to be way more likely to walk up to you than it would be. So there's two reasons for that, the angle and not spooking them. Uh, and then as far as that goes, I get muddy, I get sandy, I get wet when I do shorebird photography. It's just, that's part of the fun. 
Uh, that's one reason why I love this kind of photography. You're just out in the elements uh, and don't be afraid to kind of lie down in a mud flat. You know, that's that's what I do. And, and that's how you get these photos. So part one today, I've discussed why shorebird photography can be rewarding, some fundamentals, equipment, camera settings and field techniques I use. Secondly, I'm going to talk about light today. So light is the foundation of photography. Photography, actually, you know, the, the word photo means light. I was learning about that in chemistry the other day with photons. But photography is, you know, fundamentally all about light. Uh, you have to be, you know, thinking about light when you're taking photos in order to improve your photography. Uh, the time that I photograph birds for shorebird photography is sunrise and sunset on a sunny day. That's really important uh, with photography. Um, and I would say that this kind of golden hour is best for this type of shore bird photography, uh, harsh midday light, like say noon on a sunny day is, is not as good, good for photography. Uh, it provides less pleasing images, uh, with high contrast and muted colors. Uh, so I would say that this kind of light, so midday sunny light or cloudy light is not ideal for photography. Uh, this is a bit of a strong opinion, but when I talk about it a little later, I think you'll understand about it. Uh, but sunrise and sunset is the time that I like to photograph birds at. Here's an example of one of the photos that I took at this time of day. This is a red knot in breeding plumage uh, on the coastline in New Jersey. And my settings here were a fast shutter speed to freeze the motion of the waves. I had a high ISO value since I was uh, shooting this bird at sunset. Uh, and then lastly, my aperture was wide open. Uh, and this is an example of that golden hour light just really illuminating the colors in this photo. This photo, if this is this, if this was taken three hours beforehand, the colors of that ocean would not be as strong. And then this red color of the red knot would be a little bit more muted. Uh, that golden hour light allows you to photograph these types of birds with their full color range. This is another example of this kind of concept. This is a short bill dowager uh, at sunset again. And I, I would advocate for sunset over sunrise. First of all, because I'm not a mor morning person. I hate getting up at like 4 a.m. to go get to the place, prepare my camera equipment, and then get to the sun, uh, sunrise by like 5.30. Uh, I hate that. So that's, that's reason one. Reason two is actually a practical reason. So with sunset, what you can do is you can go birding in the afternoon. You can go look for them. You can find the flocks of shorebirds. You can find the birds that you want to photograph, set up camp, and then wait for the light. So I'll get to a place, I'll get to the beach at like, say the sunset is at like seven. I'll get there at like five. I'll go birding, I'll find what I wanna see. I'll set up and then just wait for that perfect light at the end of the sunset. In the morning, it's really hard to do that because you're trying to locate your subject in the dark and you're waiting for that sunrise because the best light is right after the sun breaks and right before it sets. Uh, so I would recommend if you're gonna go out and try to photograph stuff after this session, I would recommend go to a beach on a sunny day, two hours before sunset, find what you want to photograph, and then do an evening shoot. That's that's usually what I do for this type of photography. So a huge concept that I want to talk about uh, is where's where's the light coming from? What direction is it coming from? Uh, front light is what you usually see in most photos where the sun's at your back and your shadow's in front of you. For that, again, golden hour is best. Uh, harsher overhead light creates less pleasing images. Again, that's why I don't photograph the birds at 5 p.m. when the sun sets at 7. I photograph them, you know, preferably at like 6.15 or 6.30 onwards uh, because the light will create more please, pleasing images. And then secondly, backlight is something that I really love to photograph uh, with bird photography. The sun's in front of you facing into your lens. Um, and this, again, needs to be when the sun's low. So here's some examples of my backlight photography. Uh, so this happens when, say, on a beach, the sun's really low on the horizon and the bird tracks in front of you, in between you and the sun, and your lens is pouring directly into the sun. I love this kind of photography because you can have this called rim lighting around the bird uh, where the sun's illuminating it from the back. Uh, and you can have this kind of effect, which I love. And also all these photos have kind of an orangey tone, uh, which I find really fun. These two will Willet chicks. Uh, on a mud flat in Cape Cod. Uh, and that background is just really saturated because that backlight was coming through. The sun was actually off to the right of the frame, um, but I cropped it so that you could just see the sky behind it. And then that little outline of the backlight on the fuzzy chicks. 
Uh, so this kind of photography is just something that I love to do. And it's why I go to these places at sunset and sunrise, because you can play around with this type of light. <clears throat> this is the same moment. So this photo was kind of a little bit softer off to the right. And then this is the actual ball of the sun over the horizon uh, with a little chick in front of it. I had never seen Willet chicks before this, this day, um, but I just happened to find them. And it was a really cool moment. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, Willet chicks before, but they're really cute. Um, mm. And this sun was illuminating them really nicely. And my lens again was pointing directly into the sun. I didn't photograph this moment for very long because I didn't want to be blinded, but just a couple quick, click, uh, couple quick clicks uh, just enabled me to get this photo. Here's another example of this kind of backlight lighting. Um, this is a, I'm actually gonna, can you guys guess what type of bird this is? Can anyone raise their hand or, or say what type of bird this is? That strong decurve. It's a wimbra. Yes, perfect, exactly. Right on the money. So yeah, I was photographing this wimbrel. Um, and I just love the shape of the decurve bill. Um, and I wanted to photograph it in backlight with that beautiful sky beyond it um, and just click this photo here. So when you when you photograph not just with the sun at your back, you, it opens a ton of doors. Uh, you can photograph all sorts of types of shots. Another type of time of day that I like to photograph in is dawn and dusk. Uh, this is right after the sun sets or right before it rises. Uh, pink kind of lavender and purple colors are in the sky. Uh, which creates really cool scenic and creative compositions. In the low light, I adjust my settings accordingly and shoot actually in manual mode. So this is, I mentioned earlier, there was one time a day when I don't photograph an aperture priority. This is it. Uh, because this is when the light is so low that you have to set your shutter speed manually. Uh, so this is the perfect time to get creative uh, with shorebirds on the beach. So a huge, a huge thing that I would talk about is remember, um, that beach day where I go at 5 p.m. Uh, for a 7 p.m. sunset. So I show up to the beach at 5 p.m. I go birding. I find the birds that I want to photograph. And then I'm shooting the birds, hopefully in full sunlight at the sunset at like 6.30 before the 7 p.m. sunset. I'll stay after the sunset. So once the sun sets at 7, a lot of people just leave. Um, but I'll stay for sometimes 45 minutes after the sunset. Um and then crank my settings up, have the hot, really high ISO and slow shutter speed to get these well-lit photos. And you have these really cool lavender tones in the sky. Uh, you notice there's no direct light on this bird. You can see there's not really light in its eye and, and it's not really being illuminated. It's just illuminated from the glow in the sky post sunset. Uh, but I really love these kinds of photos uh, because you can have this purpley look uh, to the image that people kind of think is, is, you know, saturated, but it's just, you know, sometimes the beach uh, at sunset looks like this. Uh, this is a snowy egret plunging for a fish with just a, you know, very calm background. Uh, this was taken, I think this was taken at Fort DeSoto, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong, um, where you just look out into the ocean and have um, just a really calm day after sunset. <clears throat> Another example of getting creative with birds after sunset um, is this uh, image of a common turn. Uh, this, you may be wondering kind of what this is, but remember I said I stay well after sunset. This, mm -hmm. this uh, moment, I just stayed for like an hour and a half after sunset and was messing around with these birds in street lights. Um, this kind of looks like the moon to me, but yeah. in fact, this, this common turn was uh, standing on a fence post and I lined it up so that there was a street light behind it and I silhouetted it in the street light. Um, so this is an example of, of why you should stay after sunset when you photograph uh, birds, because you never know what you're going to find. And this was a scenario where I had no idea I was going to get this shot. And I stayed for like an hour, hour and a half after sunset. And I ended up clicking this uh, with the street light beyond it. This is another example of this kind of light that you get after sunset. Uh, this is a yellow legs and he's feeding in a little tidal area um, with those beautiful colors behind him. The sunset was off to the right and the sun had already gone below the horizon. And so I silhouetted this bird uh, just feeding in this little moment. Um, and, and, you know, again, this is an example of this time of, time of day with this sort of pink light. Another example here, I, I love black belly plovers and breeding plumage. I think they're really cool birds. Uh, this is another example. This is well past sunset. Probably, if I had to guess, probably 20 minutes after the sun sets, 
um, and the water was real calm. And you just kind of get these looks like he's floating in clouds um, because the, the light is so soft that it gives this kind of look. And this is just another type of photo that I love. So today in part two, I've discussed how light relates to shorebird photography, the best times of day to photograph shorebirds, sunrise and sunset on a sunny day. Um, avoiding overcast is something that's super important. Um, you can shoot in overcast for shorebirds, but for me, none of these photos in this presentation were taken in overcast light. Um, you can get good results, but all my favorite images of mine have been in, in on sunny days. Um, and then using backlighting and lighting at dawn and dusk to your advantage to get creative. If anyone has any questions, uh, this is a good time to ask either in the chat or you can just raise your hand and, and ask the questions. Somebody did ask uh, whether or not you use a special filter when you shoot straight into the sun. I don't I don't use any uh, polarized filters or uh, anything UV filters or anything like that. I just shoot right in. Yep. And I was going to ask you if you use a protective filter of any kind. I don't. No, I, I'm super careful with the lens and I also have a pretty long lens hood. So it would take a lot for something to get. It. If, you have a small, if you have a smaller lens hood, um, I would probably invest in it um, or you drop it a lot. But I'm I'm super, super careful um, to not let anything get in there. I've, I've noticed that there's a quality difference if you have a protective filter. It's just yeah. sometimes not as crisp. Um, so that's why I don't use it. Do you publish your images? I do. I, I have a website um, and I have an Instagram page that I'm going to link at the end of this presentation. I'm a, I'm a college student um, and I'm, you know, I'm an amateur, so I'm, I'm pursuing something else as my career. So I, I don't like publish them officially, but yeah, on Instagram and, and on my website for sure. I'm wondering if they also meant, do you sell your Im uh, pic images? Yeah, I, I do sell prints. Um, it's, it's on my website, but yeah, I, I work with MPix photo and, and, um, Sell prints, yeah. Uh, somebody already put in, uh, thank you. This is a wonderful, beautiful birds and photography. And Thanks. just wanted to thank you for that. Okay. Now the question is, ISO priority and manual versus aperture priority. Yeah, so I, I ISO priority, uh, I don't, I don't love, um, because I like to set my aperture manually. Um, and that, you know, doesn't let you do that. Um, manual mode, again, a huge reason why I don't use it in bird photography is because there's too many variables at once. Um, when you're, when you're adjusting three things in the field, like for a landscape photo, great for a photograph of something a little slower, like a, a person or something that's going to cooperate, uh, but birds just run all over the place. And I like the freedom of not having to adjust my shutter speed. Um, so I, I will set my aperture at wide open, um, which means, you know, F4, F6.3, whatever the lowest uh, value is on your lens. And then to, to control the light, I'll just spin the ISO dial. So if I have a scene where I'm photographing a bird uh, in bright sunlight, that's really has the potential to be overexposed. I'll crank that ISO dial down to ISO 100. Uh, and get a photo that's not overexposed. Um, and then that if that bird flies into the shade all of a sudden, and I have to swivel around and photograph it, spin the ISO out, dial up to ISO 2000 and photograph it there without having to worry about any other variables. Uh, that's why I use aperture priority. And I think that for bird photography, that's super important because if you're doing manual and that bird that's in that bright sunlight patch you know, if, if you're like, okay, I'm going to adjust my ISO. Now I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to move my shutter speed up to two thousandths of a second to compensate. And then it flies to the shaded area and you only have 10 seconds to get that shot. And you're adjusting your ISO, you're cranking up your ISO and you're moving your shutter speed down low. It's gone. So that, that, that's why I don't use uh manual mode for bird photography. Um, I think aperture priority is just way more practical. I had a question and it evaporated. <laughs> Again, aperture priority is called mode A on, on Nikon. Canon and Nikon just have their own languages, but thought I'd mention that. I'm going to read this to you because I don't know. It's uh, an excellent book on this subject is The Shorebird Guide by Michael O'Brien with excellent photography by Kevin Carlson. 
The book is comprehensive info on North American shorebird behavior. Yeah, I, no. I love that book. That was one of the, the early uh, bird books that I got. I actually know Michael O'Brien personally as well. And he, he's a great guy, really good birder. Um, and yeah, that's a, that's a cool book for sure. That's good to know. Let's see what else we got here. Um, well, <coughs> I think there's one or two being written. So do you, you don't seem to do very much in the way of uh, birds in flight. That's actually something that people people uh, mess with me about. People joke joke with me about. I, I'm not a huge birds in flight guy. Uh, I know people are really into it, um, and I do I do have some birds in flight. First of all, shorebirds are really hard to photograph in flight. Um, they don't fly a lot, and if they do, they just burst away. Mm -hmm. um, I have some photos of owls in flight, short-eared owls. Uh, I have some photos of hawks in flight, um, ducks as well. But yeah, shorebirds are hard to photograph in flight. I don't, I don't love photographing uh, birds in flight. I think I, I try to come at photography from trying to create kind of a, a photo where the scene is aesthetically pleasing and I'm kind of, you know, composing all the elements of the photo the way I like it. Uh, mm -hmm. And when birds sitting still, it's a lot easier to do that. Uh, with flight photography, I feel like it's just kind of you shoot and pray and hopefully you get a nice shot. Uh, I just kind of prefer sitting and waiting and, and getting a more uh, kind of thoughtfully composed image as opposed to flight photography. Now, flight photography can be amazing, but uh, I just enjoy the other more. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. It's a little bit less control you have when the bird is in flight picking the background. Yeah. Or just even controlling the light sometimes because it flies in the direction you <laughs> of its choosing, not yours. Um, yeah. Anybody else want to ask any questions? Yeah, and feel free to just just speak as well. I did love your oyster catcher. I love those. I I can tell which ones you sh mostly what you shot at Fort DeSoto because it was the same ones I shoot when I'm there too. Yeah, except I didn't see any reddish egrets. I saw a white morph reddish egret there. Yeah. If you go to my Instagram page. There's a photo of of him, of him there, but yeah, I saw a white morph reddish egret, which I was really stoked about. Um, and I photographed a marble goblet there as well. Yes. A uh, bunch of snowy plovers. Um, nothing like super. Actually, I did see our fork tail flycatcher that day, which was really dope. Um, that was cool. Um, ah, I love those. Somebody so, got an amazing picture there. So it was like three years ago. There's a scissor tail flycatcher, which is seen kind of irregularly in the south, but is more common in Texas. And the fork tail that's from um, kind of the tropics more. And, and he was in Fort DeSoto that day. So that was really cool. But That's awesome. Like, uh, a nice spot it really is uh somebody did put in a comment saying the oyster catcher females may have a dark fleck in the eye yeah so i've noticed some oyster catchers do have that i actually didn't know that it was females that's cool it's about 94 percent of the time so that's a pretty good uh ratio of figuring out which one's a female that's cool yeah i noticed they that some do have that fleck that's thanks for that that's interesting to know not a lot of people know that, so that's why I wrote that. Yeah, no, that. no, I had no idea either. I always wondered what that was. <laughs> they do have very unique eyes, and, and the difference between the younger eyes and the adult eyes <coughs> I found very interesting. But no, I'm going to have to look back to see a dark fleck. If there aren't any other questions, there's time at the end as well, um, but I think I'm going to continue. Ah, uh, okay. This is just a pause. Yeah, no, I, I, have, I have more content uh, and another question break at the end. Great. Thank you. All yours. So the last part that I'm going to talk about today are compositional techniques for photography. Backgrounds are probably the second most important thing I'm going to bring up today. First and foremost is light. And then secondly, are backgrounds. If you talk to any photographer, the two most important things they'll usually say about photography are What's your light looking like and what's your background looking like? Uh, far before the subject, far before focusing on sharpness or anything like that. If your background's bad and your light's bad, it's going to be a terrible photo. Um, so if you can try to try to find good backgrounds and have an eye for backgrounds, that improves your photography so, so much. Um, the backgrounds are crucial for photographing shorebirds. 
Uh, if you have a distracting background, uh, that can tend to be leading to not a great photo. What I mean by that is if there are like jumbled sticks in the background or there's uh, kind of some seaweed or something where it's going to distract the eye, um, that's going to maybe not be as good of a photo. Another thing about that is a concept called subject isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, subject isolation is crucial with shorebird photography. So when you're taking a photo, you don't want to have your subject and your background really close to each other. So imagine I'm taking a photo of a shorebird. I want to have the shorebird on a plane that's separate from the background, really far from the background. I want it to be me, the shorebird, and then a background really, really distant from the shorebird. So I want the coastline or the waves or the seaweed or the sticks to be really, really far from the bird in the background. If the, if, if the stuff is behind the bird directly, it's going to be in focus and it's going to be distracting. So you want subject isolation where your subject is isolated from the rest of the scene. Um, that is how I get these blurred out backgrounds. Um, so I'm always looking for that when I'm photographing subjects. Um, another concept that plays into this is bokeh, which refers to the little out of focus um, kind of feeling that you get from the background uh, when you have subject isolation. So subject isolation lends to bokeh. Um, and that just is kind of why all like here's a photo here. That's kind of why all my photos have that kind of blurred out look uh, in the back. That's that's the bokeh. Um, and this is also contributed um, to by a low angle. Um, if you if you can get really low with your photos, you can have a blurred out background. So this is an example of this concept. Um, there are other photos that I took of this bird from a different angle where there was less subject isolation. And this mud flat in the back here was in focus so that you, you can tell there's kind of some detail here. There's little tidal pools and mud flats back here. And it was really focused beyond the bird because there was a certain angle where the background was not isolated with the bird. I then moved, I pivoted and had the background really far from the bird just because of the angle I was at and made it blur out of focus. So that draws the viewer's eye to this sharp subject in the center, um, which enables for a better photo. Same concept here, subject isolation. The marsh grasses and mudflats beyond this uh, beautiful breeding plumage, black blade plover, were very distant. So had, had these grasses been right beyond the bird, your eye would have been drawn to them immediately. Instead, you almost just have this beautiful green gradient of color. Um, you know, this again, this is a stylistic thing. Obviously, I know some people that like to have the background more in focus. Uh, but especially for shorebirds, I just love to have those those blurred out backgrounds. Um, and the way to achieve this is, is subject isolation. Again, both these photos, sunrise, sunset uh, lighting as well. This is a wimbrel. Uh, this is an example of achieving that out of focus uh, background that I like. Um, the background was the snails uh, beyond uh, this wimbrel, this wimbrel was kind of eating these snails. You can see there's one in his in his beak here. Um, and these are these these are these out of out of focus dots of light. So each of these snails caught a little shimmer of the sunlight and made for these little out of focus circles in the background. Um, and since they were far enough away, and these marsh grasses at the top were far enough away, uh, they just blurred out of focus. Um, another another thing here to think about is not with the background, but with the foreground. I have a reflection here. And I cropped it so that you could see the whole bill uh, and the reflection below the wind roll. So foregrounds also are really important for composition. Uh, I don't think they're as vital as backgrounds, but they should just be kind of interesting and undistracting. Uh, reflections are great for foregrounds. If you can have a, a calm day, you can have that kind of glass-like reflection. Mm -hmm. uh, I love it when you can almost almost here flip the image and have the 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 reflection in the foreground be super sharp uh i, I love that uh this is elise sandpiper uh and it was just a glass calm day and he uh just you know provided this nice reflection here again uh at sunset a huge uh, part of shorebird for darby is embracing color um a lot of my photos uh, are not as colorful as this. I would say that that shorebird photography is kind of the most colorful genre of photography I do. And that's because I'm out at sunrise or sunset looking for light. Uh, so color in marsh plants or light or water uh, can just make for some really colorful photos. Uh, this is, again, why I photograph pretty much exclusively at sunset on su and sunrise on a sunny day. 
Um, and this natural light and color can make bird photos look really special. Uh, this can also work with silhouettes. So sometimes you don't need an actual focused uh, lit bird in the photo. You can just have the silhouette and the shape of the bird. And you can have, you know, really cool sunset colors in the background. This this really wasn't edited at all. This was an incredible sunset in Cape Cod uh, that was just magenta after the sunset. This was about 40 minutes after sunset. And I photographed this bird uh, with its foot up uh, in the marsh here. Can anyone tell me what this bird is? I'm curious. This is the kind of thing that the shorebird guide talks about a ton is it identifying uh, shorebirds by silhouettes. Mm. Mm. Now it's your short films. Yes, exactly. Great. Good stuff. Yeah, this is a short build Dowager. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't tell you if it was a long build or short build, honestly, from the silhouette, but this is a short build Dowager. And I knew that because I was in a certain area. But um, yeah, these, these birds are really cool. They have a sewing kind of uh, look to them when they're feeding. I don't know if any of you guys have seen this before, but Shorebird douchers are cool because, and shorebirds in general are cool. You can tell what type of bird it is from a mile away before even seeing really any color or detail on them by what kind of feeding that they're doing. So mm -hmm. shorebird douchers will, will stick their bill in the mud and do kind of a sewing machine thing up and down really quickly. And they're very active. So that's how you can tell it's a shorebill doucher um, if you're looking at them in your binoculars from, you know, a really long distance. Um, you know, obviously like spoonbills will sweep back and forth um, plovers will kind of run and hop, um, and, you know, you know, centerlings will run with the waves. Like all, all, all these birds have different kind of feeding mechanisms. Uh, wimbrels do a certain thing to oyster catchers are very animated. So you can tell what type of bird it is from a really far distance. Um, and I just love the way shorebird dowagers feed with that sewing kind of technique. Here's the luster yellow legs, um, looking at its reflection um pondering its existence and uh there's a nice sunset uh actually no this was a sunrise one of my rare morning person occasions uh, <laughs> so this was a sunrise in the marsh and the marsh was just waking up and there were um salt marsh sparrows and seaside sparrows singing over all around me um you know herons and egrets everywhere and i, I saw this little lesser yellow legs and photographed it with just the silhouette um with the sky behind him because it was such a beautiful sunrise you got the yellow legs there too in the light. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, a little bit. And I, I also liked uh the just the inclusion of these grasses here for a little bit of sense of context as well. Mm -hmm. hmm. So again, behavior is super super important for shorebird photography. Uh knowing when and where to look for shorebirds. Uh you guys are birders, so a lot of you probably uh are e-birders and you know about this, but basically how I found all my birds apart from word of mouth or someone telling me, oh, this species is here, is eBird. Um, it's free to make an account. It's on Cornell University. And uh, you can just look up any bird, any location, and you can go and find them. So if you haven't already, I would create an account. That's how I find most of my birds. If I'm visiting a new area and I want to photograph, say I want to photograph, um, I'm going to, uh, let me think of an answer or something on the fly. I want to photograph Kirtland's warbler and I'm going to Michigan to do it. You know, one, 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 you know, technique would be to ask a friend that knows where Kirtland's warblers are. <laughs> Maybe if you don't have that, you look on eBird, you look where they are, you look at the hot spots, uh, and then you try five different spots and listen for them or look for them. Um, and then you can find your own spot that way. Or say, I want to go to, you know, Galveston, Texas, and I want to photograph the shorebird migration down there. I'll look up, you know, spoonbills, longbill curlews um, in Texas. I'll look up hotspots. You know, I'll have a list of like five, 10 places, and then I'll go and look at those places and scan for them. So that's, I do research for my shorebird photography. And obviously at places that I'm familiar with, I just go out and shoot. But if I'm going to a new location, I always use eBird um, to find these birds. Um, and also it's extremely seasonal, you know, shorebird migration is, is a very small window usually. Um, and so is the breeding season. So it pays to kind of know what time of year it is and know what kind of birds are going to be there for this type of photography. Knowing the behavior subject, as I said, such as feeding or predation can help you anticipate what photographers call the decisive moment when to really uh, be ready to click the shutter um, and preparation and knowledge of the subject is key for this. So this is an example of a really cool behavior. Uh, this is a snowy egret. 
and snow egrets will dance along the marsh uh, trying to catch fish. It's not as cool as a reddish egret behavior. I have a photo of that uh, on my Instagram, but <laughs> snow egrets will chase really animatedly uh, for these fish uh, in hopes of kind of shadowing them with their wings and then stabbing them beneath them. Uh, and I knew about this behavior and saw it and then was able to click this photo. This is an example of kind of knowing what was going on here. So an osprey flew over this flock of short-billed dowichers and I saw the shadow of the osprey and I got ready to click a photo because I knew they would be kind of a little antsy. Um, so I got this dowager kind of lifting its wings up in, a, in an interesting pose uh, for this moment. Uh, again, same kind of thing, you know, I hope these kind of themes are starting to come together here. Sunset lighting. This was taken when the sun was really, really low on the horizon at golden hour. I'm at a low angle to get this blurred out background, their subject isolation beyond the bird. Um, and it just creates this visually pleasing image um, where the bird uh, is in the center of the frame with the golden hour sunlight illuminating it. Here's another image of that kind of same concept, the golden hour light. Um, subject isolation with the background, and then some cool behavior here. This is a least turn parent and chick. Um, she's brooding other chicks beneath her, um, but this kind of chick was look like he was kind of snuggling up here. So I, I clicked this shot uh, in this instance. So the difference between these two photos is light. Um, so this photo was taken at, you know, a good time of light. So this was a sunrise shoot, actually. This was probably, I would say, 20, 30 minutes after the sunrise, uh, this was a really early sunrise in like June in, in Cape Cod. So this was, um, I forget that I, I remember looking in Photoshop at the timestamp of this image. It was like 5 a.m. And then this one was like 4 or 45 a.m. So this was really, really, this was like the first 10 seconds of light hitting the dunes. Um, so this is what I love. I love to be there before and after the light is there. And you can get these images where, I mean, his his body is not even lit. So the light was just, and you can see in his eye, the reflection of the sunrise. His eye was, you know, the light was just peeking over the dunes. And you can get these really cool shots with this rosy kind of sunset light here. So this is why I love shorebird photography. Um, you can have these really creative moments with light. One thing uh, you guys might be curious about that people usually ask about is post-processing. Do I use post-processing? What's my take on it? Um, I do. I use Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop. Um, all of these images in these presentations um, are post-processed. Um, every image I share is as well. Uh, my goal is to replicate what my eye saw in the scene. Um, so I never like add anything in. I never um, take away really important content in the photo. Uh, it's always what my eye saw through the camera lens. That being said, our cameras right now are not good enough to capture what the human eye sees as far as range of color and contrast goes. So it's crucial that you post process your images if you want to get the most out of them, because cameras are just not good enough to capture what you see in person. Have you ever been in a scenario where you photograph a really pretty sunset or a nice scene and you look at the, and it's really pretty in person and you look at the photo on your iPhone, you look at the photo on your camera and it's just not that great. It's like, that wasn't what I saw. You know, this, this, this sunset was way prettier in person. Well, that, that's why I use post-processing. You know, if you if you take a photo, chances are it's not going to look as, as good as it did in person right off the camera. Um, but if you upload it to Photoshop and you're able to tweak it a little bit to make it more look look like what your, your eye saw, then you can have a really nice photo at the end of the day. So, um, again, I think it's crucial for taking your photography to your next level. If, if you're an intermediate photographer or a beginner, I would say basic knowledge of Lightroom and Photoshop is the biggest thing that you can do to improve your photography. Uh, I'm a self-taught uh, Photoshop user. Uh, I used YouTube to learn it. Um, it's a great resource. There are hundreds and hundreds of videos on Photoshop on YouTube. And there are a ton of videos on Photoshop for specifically for bird photography. A lot of photographers have like courses that you have to pay for. I would just use YouTube. Um, if you look up Photoshop and Lightroom for bird photography or Photoshop and Lightroom for wildlife photography or just Photoshop on YouTube. There'll be a ton of videos that you can use. And if you want to do that uh, with your time, uh, it's really helpful to learn. Um, my basic workflow for people that are already familiar with Photoshop includes cropping, uh, straightening as well, uh, and then basic levels adjustments. 
uh, which is how bright the image is, uh, essentially uh, saturation adjustments to color, uh, contrast adjustments, uh, so making the shadows softer or the highlights dimmer or something like that, uh, general brightness adjustments as well. And then I use dodging burning, uh, which is selectively uh, lightening and darkening areas of the image, uh, layer masking, which is when you impose a layer upon another layer, uh, and you can make selective adjustments with that. So say with layer masking, I can select the background and brighten it while the subject stays dark. So that's what you can do with layer masking. Um, I do clone stamp removal of errant objects like a little twig or something or a piece of seaweed. Um, I'll clone that out with the clone stamp. And then lastly, before I save the file, I use uh, noise reduction and sharpening. Um, so that's, that's my Photoshop workflow. I upload the images into Lightroom. Uh, I do basic level saturation contrast adjustments in Lightroom. And then I hop into Photoshop and I Photoshop the image uh, with the dodging, burning, layer masking um, adjustments that I just talked about. Uh, so that's for every single image I do. That's that's what I that's what I do to make it look as good as it can. So the key takeaways of the presentation, we're almost there, um, are that a lens of 300 millimeters or more is usually needed for this type of photography. Um, if you want to try to get into this type of photography, that's kind of the minimum uh, focal length that you need. Um, shooting wide open aperture um, with aperture priority mode is what your camera should be on when you go out and photograph these shorebirds. So more than 300 millimeters, aperture priority with wide open aperture. And by wide open, I mean the lowest value on your camera. So F4, F6.3, F8, the lowest value that it goes, that's what you want for this type of photography. Uh, try to be at eye level with your subject, preferably lying prone. Um, if you can't, sitting is better than standing. Um, and then second to last, light is the foundation of shorebird photography. I would avoid shooting in harsh light or heavy overcast. Try to do sunrise and sunset on a sunny day. Uh, and then thinking critically about your composition is really important for photography. Um, kind of, you know, five years ago, uh, I, I, I kind of started thinking about composition, you know, how am I framing my images? What's in my background? What's in my foreground? How can I make this image better by moving my position to change the composition? Because you're you're going to change the composition physically. You can move, you know, you can move to the left, move to the right, move closer, move back, and you can change the whole kind of essence of the image um, just by doing that. So if you're thinking critically about composition when you're photographing subjects, uh, that's just going to improve your photography so much. So thank you all so much for taking the time out of your day to be here with me today. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I hope you learned something new. Um, I have a website, it's camerondarnellphotography.com uh, with prints for sale. Uh, and then if you wanna connect with me, uh, my Instagram is uh, down there um, at Cameron Darnell Photo, and then my email's linked as well. Um, now's a great time to do questions. If anyone has any questions that they wanna ask verbally or, or Nancy, if you wanna, uh, ask me them from the chat. That'd be great. Um, we have two here. One is how often do dogs or people interrupt your shooting? Uh, I have had dogs and people interrupt my shooting for sure. Um, it happens. It's just part of it. Um, there's really nothing you can do. Uh, that's kind of my take on it. Um, I don't get mad at people or dogs that walk by. <laughs> I think the beach is for everyone. And, you know, I, I have a dog myself. So it's like, you know, you just kind of shake your head and then go on with your day. Um, and usually the birds fly back. So, yeah. yeah. What frustrates me sometimes is when kids find it entertainment. I was one of those kids, so. <laughs> yeah, flushing birds. I can, I can relay. I would chase seagulls when I was like five, so. I see. Hmm. Well, maybe if it was seagulls, I wouldn't feel so bad. <laughs> and let's see, do you ever shoot verticals of your shorebirds? I do. It's hard to do that when you're lying prone. Yeah, uh, I shoot verticals in other scenarios, but if you're lying prone to be like doing that with your with your uh, camera body, that that can be kind of difficult. So I can crop vertical, um, but yeah, physically shooting vertical is a little hard. Yeah, do you have a um, battery or whatever that's called that makes it easier to shoot vertical if you want? I did have one. It stopped working though. Yeah, it just like it stopped working. It died. Uh, <laughs> I have heard about it. It makes it easier to shoot vertical. I don't see a huge benefit to shooting vertical. Yeah. I mean, it's cool, but you can just crop vertical. Like what I'll do in that scenario, if I want to have a vertical photo, is I'll just shoot it, shoot it regular, and then just crop it vertical. Right. Yeah. 
So it, your eye is seeing a vertical image anyway. Yeah. Probably, yeah. And can you post, put up your um, addresses again one more time? I'll, I'll put them in the chat. It's actually just as well if you could access your, I don't know about anybody else, but I always take a picture of that, which makes it easy. So if you wanna just use your slide that has it on it, that would be fine. Yeah, I can just share it again and then you guys can take a picture real quick. How about that? That sounds perfect. Julie, is that what you wanted? Her sound must be off. Okay. Great presentation, by the way. Thank you so much. Uh, really thorough, just covers everything. Um, really wonderful. And your images are stunning. Thank you. So anybody else has any more questions or anything? Do you ever, I know you're, you're in college now. Do you ever take people on uh, birding trips? Uh, probably wouldn't have the time right now, but yeah, I have before. I let some bird walks um, at a local um, kind of, what was it, like a conservation society. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I have before, but yeah, it's just time, time's tight. So yeah. I would think so now for sure. Um, do you do any specific images for conservation? Um, let's see. Well, I try to photograph uh, species that are, you know, not doing so well, to be frank. I think that, you know, awareness on social media is really important. So mm -hmm. when I photograph species like, for example, like a piping plover, I'll write a caption about it on social media, talking about kind of the breeding patterns that are happening right now and how, you know, they're a sensitive species and how when I was photographing them, I was very careful not to get too close or, you know, do anything like that. So, yeah, I think that that's important um, for sure. Yeah. And one of the challenges with beach birds that breed on the beach is our beaches are, are pretty busy. And uh, we had a whole group of least terns settle on one of our beaches in the in Palm Beach County during the uh, COVID crisis. And so to them, it was like free. The beach was theirs. Yeah. And they, it was, it was really quite wonderful, except for the, feral cats yeah i know but, that i know the crows and the and the coyotes love the they, they get in the colonies of the plovers and the terns on the beaches yeah problem it's rough but they they ended up um when the beaches the beaches were closed for quite a while but then when the beaches opened the birds were still there so they uh roped it off and and had uh volunteers kind of watching the perimeter and answering questions for people. But it was quite exciting to see them. It was a pretty large colony. Otherwise they colonize, the least terns colonize a lot on roofs down here, the flat roofs. Oh, wow. Yeah, but there are people that go around and try to monitor these uh, roofs and catch the chicks that have fallen and are alive and, and get them back up on the roof. But there are accidents like that. But they they are monitoring it and uh, trying to keep track of the number of nests that show up on these roofs. Now I bet now they have less of a challenge since we have the aerial uh, cameras these days. Otherwise they were guesstimating so Cameron, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to say good night for now. I think everybody has asked and answered the questions they they wanted. Let's see, great. Um, yeah, th thank you all so much for for attending. I uh, hope you enjoyed it.